Oh, hi. So you clicked on this video because you want to learn something related to dentistry. Well, you are on the right place. I am Dr. Hina, the voice and soul behind Dr. Teeth. And this is the platform where we make learning interesting and incredibly easy for you. So do leave a like and subscribe to my channel and I will recommend you to join channel membership to watch our premium videos. You can also visit our website for online classes, courses, and CQs. So let's get started. Hello everyone, Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Dr. Teeth. Today we are going to learn about the Hanaus Quint. Now in the previous video, I had told you about a mnemonic of how you can remember this, you know, diagram and make it in the examination if needed. But today we are going to dive deeper into the topic and try to understand how one factors affect another factor and what is the importance of this you know, entire concept of Hanau's Quint. So without wasting any further time, let's dive into today's topic, Hanau's Quint. Now this presentation was my pedagogy presentation in my MDS. As you all know, I'm a MDS in prosthodontics. I recently completed my master's and this was my pedagogy presentation. A lot of memories attached with this. So let's begin with today's topic. So what happens is, if you have seen or if you have noticed natural dentition, what happens when the mandible is moved forward, you find a wedge shape space in the posterior region, okay? So that wedge shaped space that is called as the Christensen's phenomena, right? Now, if we have the same wedge shaped space in our denture, okay, what will happen? The denture will lose stability, the upper denture will fall down, lower denture will lift up, so in complete denture, we don't require this space. So in complete denture, we have to make it in such a way that when the patient moves his mandible forward, there is contact of the teeth at least at one point on the left side, one point on the right side and also one point in the front. So that is a balanced occlusion. So that means we need a balanced occlusion in complete denture, but we don't need balanced occlusion in natural dentition. Why? Because if we have a lot of contacts in the natural dentition that are in fact considered as interferences, so that will be deleterious for the natural dentition, but it is, you know, recommended to have in the complete denture because obviously complete denture, it acts as a complete unit. The teeth don't have periodontal ligament, okay? They are all, you know, stuck in the acrylic, they are acting as one unit. So, let's see. We have seen that without having that three-point contact, the denture is kind of unstable, okay? So, we need at least three-point contact, one anterior and two posterior on either side. Now, by definition, balanced occlusion is the bilateral simultaneous occlusal contact of the anterior and posterior teeth in excursive movement. So by definition, balanced occlusion is the bilateral simultaneous occlusal contact of anterior and posterior teeth in excursive movement. So this, you can see, this is the temporomandibular joint and this is the teeth, okay? So this relation determines the centric relation okay and the occlusion which is there at this relation that is the centric occlusion the occlusion which is present when the mandible is in centric relation is the centric occlusion okay we also have one more term that is the maximum intercuspation so maximum intercuspation means you know all the teeth are in maximum contact but the patient may be in centric or, you know, he may not be in centric, okay? So, MIP may or may not coincide with the centric relations. For example, suppose in this case, the patient is in centric relation, but the teeth here, as you can see, we have spaces here, little, little spaces. So, that means the teeth are not in maximum intercuspation. So, this is the centric occlusion because the patient is in centric relation, but when you allow the patient to, you know, close on maximum intercuspation, this particular relation might change, okay? I hope we are clear with the difference between MIP and centric occlusion. 
let's proceed now shefford stated enter bowler's exit balance so shefford said that even if we are giving three point contract in the denture the patient is not chewing not doing anything then it's fine we have a three point contract and the denture is balanced but what if the patient eats as soon as the patient eats the balance will be disturbed because we have a food bowlers in between the dentures right so then the denture will become unstable so shefford said what is the point of giving the balanced occlusion then so why do we need to do all those hectic steps balancing and all to have this but the reason for that is chewing movement happens only for certain duration of time you're not going to eat the entire day right but for the maximum time we will get the benefit of this balanced occlusion so in hanau squint we have five factors the condyla guidance incisal guidance occlusal plane compensating curve and the cuspal inclination so let's see the condyla guidance first okay so as the mandible is moved forward you found a space there right but if the patient has a steeper condyla guidance the amount of space here will be more isn't it let's rewind this see this is the initial you know curvature which determines the condyla guidance the patient is moving along obviously the mandible will move along this guidance because it's a bony structure it is not going to bump there right so we have let us suppose this amount of space now we have another patient whose condyla guidance is coming like this okay we have a little more slope here so when this patient will protrude we will have more amount of space here isn't it so so when we have a shallow condyla guidance this top one we had little space here right so to get a balanced occlusion we will need shorter cusp and flatter fossa means even with the shorter cusp you will be able to get that contact okay but if we have a steep condyla guidance then the amount of space is more so how do you get that point contact we need what we need a longer cusp and deeper fossa to get that contact to get that contact here and here okay so i hope this is clear now and always remember that we can't change the condyla guidance why we can't change the condyla guidance because it is a bone to bone relationship it is already present in the patient it is by anatomy by nature you cannot change it so that is about the condyla guidance how do we set this condyla guidance on the articulator by using the protrusive record we make this will be explained in detail when we cover the entire balancing i have the demonstration with me i'm just not getting the time to upload it i'm so sorry but hopefully with all your comments and feedbacks i'll get that kick to make the video so in short in brief what we do we take the centric and the protrusive record of the patient we place the protrusive record we adjust the condyla guidance here okay this gives the h value and here the l value is there which is found out by a formula l is equal to h by 8 plus 12 okay now coming to the next factor which is the incisal guidance it is defined as the influence of the contacting surfaces of the mandibular and maxillary anterior teeth on the mandibular movement so let's see these are our anterior teeth so by definition it is the influence of the contacting surfaces of the mandibular and maxillary anterior teeth on the movement so basically this definition states that the contacting surfaces of the anterior teeth it will determine the mandibular movement it will determine the mandibular movement let's try to understand this this is the amount of overbite and this is the amount of overjet okay and this particular angle that we get is the incisal guide angle now let us suppose we have more overbite what happened the incisal guide angle increased right so when the mandible is now moved forward you can see this is edge to edge okay there is space here right if the overbite was a lot more the space here would be a lot more you can imagine that like if we have let us suppose this was the scenario okay 
this is the mandible teeth so for this mandible to move and come edge to edge a lot of gliding is needed and a lot more posterior space will be created in that case right okay so one way to compensate for this is to increase the over jet so that the angle decreases and we have less space in the posterior region and we find it easier to balance so when we have a steep incisal guidance we need longer cusp obviously because if we have a steep incisal guidance there will be a lot more space so we need longer cusp steep occlusal plane occlusal plane we'll be studying in detail as we move ahead and steep compensating curves so compensating curves if they are steep means they have more curve it will be easier to balance okay so in that case in steep incisal guidance we can do a combination of these now by formula incisal guidance is equal to 2 cusp height twice the cusp angle minus the average condylar guidance this you might be asked in the viva or in your mds examination let's come to the next one that is the orientation of occlusal plane now what is occlusal plane it is an imaginary surface which is related anatomically to the cranium and which theoretically touches the incisal edges of incisor and the tips of the occluding surfaces of the posterior teeth occlusal plane falls at the corner of the mouth so the occlusal plane it is an imaginary surface we are talking about the entire surface so basically it is a plane or a surface which is related to the cranium and it touches the incisal edges of incisor all the way to the occluding surface of posterior teeth when you look at the mouth of the patient it is somewhere at the corner of the mouth coming to the compensating curve what is compensating curve by definition it is defined as the anterior posterior and lateral curvatures in the alignment of occluding surfaces and incisal edges of artificial teeth which are used to develop balanced occlusion let's see we have two types of compensating curve the anterior posterior and the medial lateral curve so this is the anterior posterior curve starting from the anterior tip of the canine all the way to the last tooth to the ramus of the mandible and this is the medial lateral curve this is the buccal cusp okay and this is the lingual and this is the medial lateral curve now again if we have a flat compensating curve let us suppose obviously when the patient moves the mandible forward there will be a lot of space so how we can get balanced occlusion we can increase the compensating curve to get that balanced occlusion now how does medial lateral curve work so when the patient moves the mandible side to side you can see that one of the cusp is always in touch right the denture stable also when we do the teeth arrangement of the posterior we say that the mesopalatal cusp is touching the glass slab and other cusp are not touching so that is basically given for the curve of wilson okay you can appreciate that only the palatal cusp is touching that is the reason we do that now let's talk about the cuspal inclination what is cuspal inclination it is the angle made by the average slope of the cusp with the cusp plane measured mesodistally or buccolingually also called the cusp angle and we have this formula incisal guidance plus half condylar guidance minus incisal guidance so this Thilman's formula summarizes everything we have the condylar inclination into incisal guidance divided by occlusal plane into cuspal inclination and compensating curve very important remember this for your exams so to summarize let's see what all we have in the Hanau squint we have five factors we learned condylar guidance, cuspal height, plane of occlusion, curve of spee, incisal guidance. So as the condylar guidance increases, okay, the cuspal height, plane of occlusion, curve of spee increases while the incisal guidance decreases. Now if the cusp height is more, so how to understand this? We have more condylar guidance here. We have a lot more space here. How can we correct it? By increasing the cuspal height or changing the plane of orientation which cannot be done more than 10 degrees if i had not told you before about this i'm sorry and curve of speed by giving a steep curve of speed so that when the patient moves his mandible forward 
there is contact there. Now, if we have selected a teeth having a increased cuspal height, what all we can do? Now, condylogyrins, it cannot be changed. It has to be recorded from the patient. What you can change is the plane of occlusion. You can decrease the plane of occlusion, the degree of plane of occlusion, and you can decrease the curve of speed because you have a because you have an increased cusp height to deal with. Then plane of occlusion, if we have increased plane of occlusion, what all we can do? Again, condylogyrins cannot be changed. Cuspal height can be decreased, curve of speed can be decreased, and the incisal guidance can be increased. Let's talk about the curve of speed. If we have increased curve of speed, we can decrease the cuspal height, plane of occlusion, or increase the incisal guidance or a combination of these to get a stable occlusion. Then coming to the incisal guidance, if it is increased, the cuspal height can be increased, the plane of occlusion can be increased and the curve of spi can be increased. I also have another video on the mnemonic of Hanaus Queen, so you can check out that video. It will really help you recall if in case you get confused. Thank you so much. I hope you found this video helpful. Let me know in the comment section below if you found this video helpful. Please do subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Also, you can download our app. Dr. Teeth app is available on the Play Store. It is also available for Apple devices and the app name is My Institute for the Apple guys. If you are an Apple user, just search My Institute on the App Store and enter the organization code as ZJXOR. I have a lot more videos there, so I hope they will benefit you. I'll see you in the next video. Take care. Alhafiz.